So now in this last look at how breathing works, we're going to entitle the next flowchart Breathing 3. And what we're focusing on in this idea of breathing is the control of breathing, how breathing is regulated in other words. So let's take a look. The control of breathing is going to be summarized in figure 42.28. And what we want to understand initially is the following. We all know that we can hold our breath, and that's something that can voluntarily happen. So we'll write that down. You can hold your breath voluntarily. But what we want to remember and recognize about this voluntary control that we have is that we can only hold our breath for so long. So there's only a short amount of time that this can happen voluntarily. So in this short amount of time, what's going to happen after that time has passed? Well, eventually, the autonomic nervous system is going to kick in. So this is only going to be happening, you only can hold your breath until the autonomic nervous system, which is a part of the overall mechanism, um, nervous system that you cannot control. So until the autonomic nervous system kicks in, then that comes in and it sort of says, hey, you need to start breathing, even though you're holding your breath voluntarily. And in order to promote that, this is what's basically goes to what's going to ensure that you regulate your breathing correctly. The autonomic nervous system is what comes in and regulates breathing. And the, it also is what comes in and un, un, unconsciously does its job. So it's not under any sort of conscious control. Not under conscious control. Um, let me rewrite that. Conscious control. Okay, so we now understand this. The autonomic nervous system controls breathing. But how does it do it? What does it utilize? Where are the structures that this is all occurring at? The control of breathing is happening mainly at the medulla oblongata. This is a structure found within the brain. And the medulla oblongata, this is spelled with an O here, um, as a part of the brain and its structure is going to be where we have breathing control centers. This is where we understand and regulate breathing throughout and for the rest of the body. So the medulla oblongata is the place where we establish a breathing rhythm. It's going to ensure that either you breathe heavily or less heavily or more heavily, depending on the situation. So that's the rhythm that we're talking about, how much you breathe and how often you breathe. That's the breathing rhythm that you obtain from the medulla oblongata's method messages. So we have a breathing rhythm established here. The medulla oblongata uses the pH of the CSF the cerebrospinal fluid that encounters the medulla oblongata. And in order to use that pH, what it uses it for is basically as an indicator. The pH that's going to be um, found within the CSF, that's an indicator. It tells the medulla oblongata of the amount of blood CO2 concentration. And we can look at CO2 concentration or abbreviate it with these brackets. This is telling you how much blood carbon dioxide is dissolved, how much di dissolved carbon dioxide is found and what concentration it's, is it found in within the blood because the CSF has a very similar arrangement to whatever whatever's going on within the blood and therefore we can use that as a recognizable and understandable indicator of what's going on throughout the rest of the body in terms of CO2 concentration. Now, why is CO2 concentration even important? Why is that, why is that the thing that the medulla oblongata regulates breathing off of. Well, what we need to understand is that the carbon dioxide that's going to be formed as a result of cell respiration processes and also water are both going to mix and in a reversible reaction, they're basically going to combine with each other. In reversible reaction produces what is known as H2CO3. This is carbonic acid. So we'll write that in parentheses. So when carbonic acid is produced, almost immediately what's going to happen 
after the production of carbonic acid is another reversible reaction in which H2CO3 in a separate reversible reaction almost immediately then forms and produces a bicarbonate ion produces HCO3 minus. HCO3 minus is a bicarbonate ion that's going to result in an effect on blood pH. But what we need to understand about all of this is the following. The more CO2 you have, the more that your cells are working and respiring and using or giving off CO2 as a byproduct of cell respiration, the lower the blood pH. So we need to keep that in mind. This is basically a very major characteristic of breathing control. The more CO2, the lower the blood pH. The more acidic the blood, the more CO2 there is, in other words. So, big idea here is the following. The more or higher CO2 concentration that you see and observe a higher CO2 concentration is going to mean that the metabolic rate is high as well. So we're going to have a higher CO2 concentration within the blood when usually the metabolic rate is also pretty high, when, and when the metabolic rate itself is at an increased state. This is going to cause a decrease in pH as stated by the rule here, the more CO2, the lower the blood pH. Higher CO2 concentrations with an increased metabolic rate means a low pH in acidic blood, therefore. And this is going to be recognized by the medulla. Specifically, chemoreceptors, which are things that can detect pH changes, um, even the slightest of pH changes, these chemoreceptors are going to be found within the medulla. Those are basically going to be activated or recognize pH changes via being uh, sort of stimulated by the CSF that's found in the brain. But also, within the major blood vessels of the body, the blood vessels themselves, the BVs, the major blood vessels, actually also have chemoreceptors within them that can also detect the slightest pH changes. And um, based off of that detection can change the way that breathing is done, can regulate the way that we have breathing based off of whatever uh, medulla input the body gets. What type of input can happen based off of the medulla's recognition of an increased CO2 level within the blood? Well, the medulla itself in this situation sends signals to let's say the parts that are going to do the actual mechanism of breathing. Let's say the muscles, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, the rib cage, all of that thoracic area are going to get medulla signals in order to, in a, so, sort of as a message, a command to increase the depth and also increase the rate of ventilation, of breathing in and out. So what does increasing depth mean and what does increasing rate mean? These both simply mean to breathe more, to take in more, and also to breathe faster, right? Breathe more and also breathe deeper. Both of these things basically mean to increase the rate, breathe more, and increase the depth, breathe deeper, take deeper breaths. Both of these are going to combine to combat the higher CO2 concentration that happens if your cells are doing a lot of cell work, if your cells are in an environment that's in a low pH, in other words. When you have both of these occur simultaneously, this will subsequently increase the pH because when you in this increases the pH back to normal, and that's because of the fact that you are going to be exhaling CO2 out at a much higher rate. And if you're exhaling, if you're removing CO2 out at a higher rate, at an increased depth, you're thus going to overall uh, combat this problem initially of a lower pH by increasing the pH by getting rid of all this high concentration of CO2 that was within the blood. The end-all be-all in terms of breathing regulation and control is that the amount of CO2 dissolved within the blood plays a big role in determining how much and how often breathing should happen. That covers our look at the control of breathing. 
what we're going to conclude this lecture on now is the details or are, are, are the details behind the specific components of gas exchange within the body.